Well, hello. Hello. We're back again. And uh, welcome everybody to our second uh, lesson. This one on the pillars of success. And I'm here again with Chagai Cohen, my esteemed friend and uh, co-teacher in the course um, Career Management in the Technological Age, which is all about how to be amazing in your life. Chagai, how are you? Couldn't be better. Okay, so, so today we're going to talk about uh, winning strategies and uh, the three pillars of success. Um, but these are going to be my three pillars, and you have other pillars. So um, we're going to uh, discuss those. Before we do that, let's summarize our previous discussion, which was about creative thinking. Um, first of all, we explained that there's many different kinds of human creativity. We explained that it's going to be more and more critical for our success as human beings in the uh, digital future. We talked about um, what characteristics creative people have, and, and, and we decided that uh, childish, playful uh, attributes are common to uh, creative uh, people, inventors, authors, and, uh, and what have you. And then uh, we realized that um, the creative process is a two-step interaction between our childish, playful, what uh, Jill Bolte Taylor calls our third brain, this brain which doesn't speak, doesn't read, doesn't write, but wants to have fun, and our adult logical brain, uh, which uh, wants to get the right answer to the question. So uh, we talked about um, the fact that inventions are juxtapositions of really good questions and really good answers. And for the most part, we teach uh, creativity as problem solving, but basically it's much more than that because you have to have a really good problem to solve. Einstein once said that if he had 60 minutes to work on a problem, he'd work for 55 minutes on asking it properly, on, on the hypothesis, on what he really wants to ask and five minutes on finding the nifty solution. Um, we talked about thinking between the boxes. The creative people take things that don't appear to be related to each other and find these unexpected correlations. And we tested our hypothesis talking about chocolate and uh, finding things that weren't connected to chocolate and then finding ways to connect them anyway. And, and one of the things that um, I maintain, and you correct me, is that, that um, when you're thinking between boxes, Chagai, it's more fun. When you let the, the playful child come into your uh, equation, it's a lot more fun. Yes. Uh, it's like uh, building... Uh, Lego to create uh, a different thing that uh, an, an idea you have starting with the Lego which are Lego bricks which you can make them uh, out of them a castle a house whatever you want a car a bicycle if you know how to use them so yeah. this is the, this is the kind of creativity that the child has. And uh, if he is not really trying to imitate or to do the, exactly as the drawing that he gave, gave him, then all of a sudden all the world opens to him. And yes, it's, and, and it, it's like a, even making a, a talking doll. I, I'm, I'm exaggerating, of course. A talking doll that sp doesn't speak a word but speak all the languages, if you want. The child, can, the child can talk to it and get answers and without a, 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 any any word, only because he built it and he created this creature. So this is a kind of thing that I always like to do in all my life, actually getting words, make them into sentences, making even even making connecting two words to make a funny word out of it. And and many many other things like this. One of absolutely. So one of my um, exercises that we shared last week was 
was playing word games, coming up with new words. Um, what you mentioned is called a portmanteau, when you take two words and you make one word out of them. Um, and uh, you know me, I love to invent words and uh, I do it yeah. all the time. You do and, it all and, the time. And, and, and the, the other terrible. thing is, yeah, we want to we want to emphasize what you said about the Lego, that creativity should have some kind of gamification to it. It should be fun. It should be a game, not necessarily um, for for profit, more for fun. And then sometimes when you get the really good ideas, they're also profitable. Um, and this is what we see when we go to Kinernet and other um, uh, unconferences of creative people. We uh, find people having fun. Uh, and these people are sometimes inventors and heads of big companies. Um, so the atmosphere of having fun is an atmosphere in which um, you uh, let your guard down, you let your child come out, you're with people who don't criticize you for appearing ridiculous, but rather applaud you. And um, there's a lot of uh, theories as to where the best place for creative people should be. Um, Richard Florida has shown that there's a correlation if you live in a city that's tolerant of people that are weird. Um, if you have a group of people that you're working with, if you can toss ideas uh, together with people who won't make fun of you for having outlandish ideas. And part of the problem, we talked about this with, with your work in a big company, is that um, it's hard to be creative in a big company because uh, people um, tend to this new ideas and and to this people who are um, a little bit um, childish, a little playful, uh, and we saw that together, didn't we? You want me to comment? Only if you want to. Well, yeah. Well, we we we, we went to a conference and we saw how difficult people have being playful and creative when their bosses are looking over them and telling us all the time how yeah, much they pay. Is, this brings us back to the theory that thinking out of the box, which I, I hate it. I hate this expression because inside the box, there is no light, no air. And nothing you, you see nothing and the, the lead is closed on you and the lock the boss hold, holds the lock the key to the lock then you have to be creative but if you open the box and you look around you have so many choices you don't know where to go exactly so, in a way a, being inside the box is a, the place to be creative there, there is okay. no food no light I, no food, I, no air. I, I, I hate being inside the box so i would prefer to be okay uh, between the boxes. But Haggai, you did say something really important yesterday um, about necessity being the mother of invention. Yes. Um, and I'm also going to uh, say that sometimes when you're under pressure to come up with a creative solution, that gets the juices flowing. But also, let's remember what Jeff Pulver said about the shower moments, the, the moments that you have when you're doing something routine, when you let your mind flow when you're washing the dishes. Um, for me, that's when I get a lot of, uh, of my better ideas. Um, so we talked about creativity um, as a uh, winning strategy in life. Um, it isn't always because sometimes you're in a corporation, um, but it should be. And now we're going to move on to today's subject, which are the three pillars of success. And I'm going to preface it by saying that, well, I'm going to talk about my three pillars today, but everybody's different. All of us are individuals. And um, when you're looking back at your career the way that we are, then you have a, like a backwards look of what worked for you. So then also your theories are based on the stuff that worked. Um, we always tell our stories backwards. So Haggai and I both have had careers, multiple careers. And when we talk about our careers, it's always looking backwards. We say, oh, this worked. That didn't work. This is what young people should do. And that's not necessarily the case, but still, perhaps some of the things that we talk about are going to have some resonance with the uh, young people in our class. So Haggai, um, 
I'll talk about my pillars and then you can talk about yours and whether this works for you or not. Okay. So um, why don't you ask me, Mel, what is pillar number one? Okay, Mel, what's a pillar number one? For you? That's a great question. <laughs> we talked about the importance of asking questions. Okay, so, so for me, Chagai, uh, what worked in my career is uh, what I call acquiring unexpected skills. True. Okay. Um, what are what are unexpected skills? Well, if you study industrial engineering, you have the expected skills, right? That you think that you need to acquire to be a good industrial engineer. What would those be, Chagai? You're you're much more of an engineer than I am. Well, you you mentioned yesterday um, that I build my own house. Uh, I, I I think that I can take any person who wants to and teach him how to build a house. The problem is that you must have two things: it's a chutzpah and um, courage because without the courage you wouldn't be able to even go purchase the, the bricks when i went the first time to purchase the bricks people looked at me are you crazy who are you what do you need bricks well, for? Okay, when, when you were building your house by yourself yeah. were there moments when you said oh my goodness how am i going to do this um how am i going to raise tons of bricks how am i going to do x y and z did no, you have mo moments? Problem was, moment, one second. Did you have yeah. moments of self doubt? Yes, I had all the time. But that's what I meant to build a house in a very conventional way. That if I would fail somewhere, someone else will come over and take and, and and continue it. That was my basic idea. But within this idea, I was sometimes fifteen minutes before re learning about the profession that I'm going to make. And, and, and let me tell you one thing. It's the building a house, which it seems to be, uh, the, the, everybody is, dreams about to have a, his own house, is made of many sub-professions that each one of them I can teach you in 15 minutes. The skill is the problem. The skill to getting the ability to do it fast and, and nice. And this is the problem. Now, the skill for the skill, which I did not have, I invented tools to improve my skills. That was that was my difficulty, and that's what. And once I learned that I can do it, the sky was the limit. I, I was not afraid anymore. Okay, so 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 Chagai, one of the um, characteristics, the winning characteristics that you have, is that you're never afraid or intimidated to learn something new. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but I, but I, but I, I yeah. want to take sure. this. I want to I want to take this and expand. So, Chagai, we have students in our class uh, who are studying industrial engineering. So they have mathematics. They study MATLAB. They study INFI. And they study um, equations and transformations and uh, physics and um, all kinds of uh, theories of organization. And I'm arguing that these courses are not really important for their success later on in life. And yet, when I speak to the students, and I'm speaking to you guys, students, the important thing for them is passing the exams, getting good marks. And I say, no, 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 this isn't really important. Because every industrial engineer in the world studies the same MATLAB, they study the same INFI courses as you do, and this doesn't give you any edge. Moreover, a computer can learn all these courses in a millisecond and get 100 on any, on any exam. So it's not that you're wasting your time, but these, these are the expected skills that make you the same as everybody else, that make you average, that make you easy to get rid of the moment that a robot or AI comes along. Are we in agreement so far, Chagai? Yes, but let me comment on this one because this is very important. Uh, when I was teaching uh, and teaching pilots and engineers to fly, 
I had a tremendous amount of failures. 60% failed of the people who came with the same credentials and the same skills and the same everything, and they failed. And uh, I didn't know what to do. It was all on me because it was my responsibility. And I started, I hired a psychologist who made the, uh, the task analysis of a pilot, of an engineer. And we learned that we, we go through the files of everybody, about 150 of them. And we learned that the people who had the ability to study by themselves, these are the kind of people we need. Because we cannot teach everything and every possibility that will have an, happen in the, in the lifetime of a pilot. It, it's impossible. But the ability to study or to learn, actually, not to study, to learn by, by yourself, this is the most important thing. And, now, and Chagai, some, sometimes you're in a situation where you have to think on the spot. It was just on the television about this pilot uh, flying at uh, 600 miles an hour and his uh, and the um, the glass, the dome of the yeah. airplane flew off because of birds. Yeah. yeah. And he, he managed to land successfully. Yeah. Um, but, but, but Haggai, I want to take you farther away. Okay, because you're talking about making things. Okay. Okay. I want to, I want to, because my pillar isn't only making things. My pillar is to take the skills that have no use because I could make an argument that if I want to build a house, then there's all kinds of manuals. And, and if I want to fly an airplane, there's, there's monitors and there's teachers and there's courses, but the people who, who, who succeed, who chart out the new territories, okay. Beyond survival. Okay. Um, in, in, in what I've learned, they have unexpected skills. I, I, I like to take the, the case of, um, of Steve Jobs, who um, took a course in calligraphy because he had nothing better to do. Nothing better to do. And it turned into one of the uh, success stories of the world because he realized that he could build any font that he wanted out of uh, pixels at the beginning of Apple. You're bringing another angle to this uh, discussion. I'm, I'm bringing a, a, the, the widest angle that I can, because I'm going to argue, Chagai, that if you're an engineer, an engineer or an engineering type, okay, the best way for you to succeed is to learn things that have nothing to do with engineering. True. And then to connect. But, but in general, you cannot invent anything if you're not qualified in more than one profession because you wouldn't be able to do it. So if you, uh, if you, if you say that to be a better engineer, you have to know philosophy, I agree with you. But if you, but if you, if you want really to invent something which is out of your scale, you need to have... Uh, ability in chemistry, in in, in, in in other professions as well, because most of the things that we do today are combined with many professions. I, I took, for example... Oh, well, was I, I'm going to agree with you. You don't agree? I'm going to, of course I agree. Oh, okay. But, but we're not talking about invention as the only way to be successful. Because remember oh, here, but okay? you brought it in. You said that you, you brought it up, not not me. Yeah. I'm, okay. I'm some, it, some, okay. Sometimes I'm wrong, and then you. No, no, no. You're not wrong. You. No, but I, I I didn't want to qualify it because what we want to teach is exactly what you said. That in this particular day and age, when nobody knows what an industrial engineer really is, and whatever our students are learning, including data analysis can be done better by computers if you ask them the right questions and which data to analyze. So 
when I was teaching designers, I would say, what do, what do designers have to know about the world to be good designers? And what, what's the answer? If you want to be a really good designer, what do you, what do you need to know about the world? Human, uh, human ability, human... Yeah. Well, I, my argument is you need to know everything. But for this course, Haggai, what we want to emphasize is the human side. The only way that you can compete in the future is to be a fantastic human being. Uh, true. So you have to be a social animal. Yes. And, 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 and most engineering courses don't teach you to be social, to be human. Sure. Sure. They teach you to compute. And, and machines do that much better than we do. And um, um, let, so let, let, let's talk about the unexpected skills okay uh that worked in uh your career my career um and and and, and a student for example i was speaking to students about english Let, let's talk about english for a moment how important that is most of our students don't speak english well yeah, how is that possible yeah i know <laughs> It, it's possible, but they speak other languages. I mean, in, in our country, we have people that don't speak English, but speak other languages. No, I'm talking about our students, most of oh, whom only know yeah, Hebrew. They, they, okay, today... And a, 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 little bit of, a little bit of written Arabic sometimes. Today, the most and, important. And language. some English. Enough English to get good scores in their high school diploma, which isn't really English. It's a kind of an English. Okay. Kind of an English. Yeah, the kind like, of the English that we it's, teach. It's, it's like the American who came to England. You see, so he met more people that speak English and not so bad. Exactly. So, anyway. so it, English is an example. If you if you've reached third year engineering, and your English skills are are not really excellent, I'm going to argue. Forget about MATLAB. Forget about INFI. Concentrate on English. Get eighty in your standard exams. But but but. Work on your English. You know, Haggai, most students at Shankar, they just try and get a ptor. They try and get an exemption from studying yeah. English. Rather than saying, how can we improve our English skills so we can read and present and meet people and travel the world and be amazing? But I'm going to ask you now, is it worthwhile to learn any language? Give me a language that has, that like, has no value and i'm going to argue swahili i don't i don't know what, what do you want to say yeah vietnamese I, very first of all it's very important to learn other language be, be, any other language any, any other, other language? in any other language for because when you learn another language a chair is not a place to sit it's a concept and it has many names in let's say the eskimo has 20 names for a rain you learn a lot from the, just listening to this idea. Because, yeah. Haggai, you gain, you gain another, uh, another world. Yeah. yeah. Every language teaches you another world. Right. It, does, it doesn't matter whether it's Vietnamese, Swahili. Uh, yeah, I agree. Um, it's so. important to learn languages, even for engineers. And I'm going to argue, especially for engineers much more important than learning um, some computer language. But Haggai, I'm going to ask you now, I'm going to give you a riddle. Okay. Okay, what language am I going to tell the students that they have to learn or that they should learn, um, which is unexpected and not a language that you speak? It's more important than a language that you speak. English, that's what you're going to say. That's not what I'm going to say. More important than English. English is critical. Well, What's even you, more important than English? Well, you, you asked me, <laughs> you want me to answer that? I'll tell you. If you are a pessimist, if you're an optimist, learn Arabic. And if you are a pessimist, learn uh, Iranian. Okay, Haggai, so, these are languages that you can speak. Oh, you mean learning about languages you can speak? Yes. What is, what is the language... That was here before all other languages. Yeah, what is the, the language that makes us human beings? 
I mean the hieroglyphs, so maybe even before that, the the yetedot. How do you say that? The, the... no language, Chagai language. How did people communicate before they had language with their mouths? What was it called? Hands. Huh? Hands. Sounds. <coughs> sounds. What do we call sounds today, Chagai? That you don't yes. speak necessarily. Music. Yeah. So music is the proto language of the world. Mm -hmm. Music lights up hundreds of places in our brain when we listen, when we sing, when we listen to a concert, when we play music. It touches all of our intellectual and our limbic system and our emotions and our memories. When you play music to a computer, what does it do? It, it analyzes the music, maybe. Yeah. It doesn't love the music. It doesn't get all excited. It doesn't get teary-eyed. So Yeah, but it's ask, not the same. It's not the same. It's not the same. I'm going to argue, Chagai, that music is more important for engineering students than MATLAB, the computer languages, even more than English. Yeah. Music is very important. I agree with you. And yet, you don't play a musical instrument. <laughs> yeah, true. You love music. You talk to me all the time well, about music, and you don't play a musical instrument. Yeah, I know. Okay, I didn't have a chance. Okay, so during <laughs> this course, Haggai, every student and the teachers undertake to make a change in their lives. And your change is going to be to play music. Fine. You want me to play music? Yes, okay. so you're going to make a musical performance at the end of the course for the student. <laughs> okay, I will. Okay, wonderful. So uh, what other unexpected skills can we talk about? It, 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 it could be anything, right? If, it, if, it's un, if it's unexpected. Okay, this for me is the pillar of my success. So, for example, is studying the philosophy of science. You mentioned philosophy. We don't teach philosophy to our engineering students. What a big mistake. Philosophy, it's so important. Yeah. We don't teach music. Um, and when I studied philosophy of science, it changed my whole thinking about the universe. And um, as a chemistry student, I took an unexpected course in how life began. And all the other students there who pulled the course and they took it as an elective and they showed up, they didn't show up. They went to their standard courses where they had to get good marks. And I went to a guy and I was like this. And I sat there. I said, oh my goodness. How did life begin? Well, you know, if you believe in God, that's okay. And if you believe that a, a spore landed here four billion years ago, but you still have to ask yourself, where did that spore originate? Where did life come from? If it came from molecules, how were cells created? And I, Haggai, I was a, in that course. That course ch ended up changing my life because... I became a scientist studying the exclusion of water and other surfaces, hydrophobicity. I, I'm not even going to go into how, how music changed my life. You know, as, as a scientist, if you show up at a conference and you can sing and play the piano and play the saxophone, you're going to get invited to a whole lot more conferences and you're going to meet a lo whole lot of other scientists. Aren't you? So, what are the other ways of acquiring unexpected skills beyond taking courses? Experimenting. Okay. How about hobbies? Well, actually, actually, to acquire other profession, you have to 
Try and fail. That's the main idea. And failures teach you more than anything else. And um, the more you fail, the more you know, you, you find your path. Okay. Haggai, you don't need hobbies, but most people have hobbies that are somehow unrelated to what they do. And I'm sure in our class, we have people who collect stamps and people who like to travel and uh, people who, um, who are bird watchers. And, and my contention is that this is really important because if you have a passion about something, the best thing you can do in this era with this future challenging us is to take your hobbies and your passions, even if it's bird watching, and turn these into professions. Because the story that we talked about about the the pilot uh, losing his um, his uh, uh, dome, Ooh. I forget what it's called. Dome, dome. Yeah, um, was because birds flew into it. Mm -hmm. So imagine if you can invent because you love bird watching and you love engineering, you know, ways that better ways to avoid flocks of birds or warning flocks of birds. Hey guys, a, um, you know, there's a, uh, an airplane on the way to you fly in another direction, please. You know, um, the, 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 these, these connections, right? If you're, if you're a coffee lover, and you're passionate about coffee, you can combine coffee and engineering in a million different ways. So hobbies, in my estimation, if you're passionate about them, these can turn into amazing careers in this day and age. I'm a big fan of having hobbies. Okay? Uh, what other ways? I want to talk about two other ways of, um, of acquiring unexpected skills. Okay? And uh, this is one that you and I um, experienced because we both grew up in uh, in families that weren't wealthy. And um, I'm going to call this uh, the odd job uh, scenario. When you say in English, you know, I had an odd job. An odd job, the odd means, you know, just a, a different job, right? An odd job or something that means the men, you know, something that just occurred. Yeah. Is the um, yeah. But I like the word odd from peculiar, you know, odd jobs. Okay. So what, what odd jobs did you have as a kid growing up in Jerusalem in the 1940s with poverty, with war, um, with a father who couldn't always support the family because of his uh, restrictions? What odd jobs did Haggai Cohen have? I know a few of them. <laughs> One of them, it's very important, it's cooking. I learned to cook from when I was uh, 10 years old or nine even. Uh, uh, there was a shortage of food in Jerusalem and people were standing in lines to get them. And my mom, with a typical joke or sense of humor, said to me, okay, I'm going for two minutes. Every 15 minutes, stir the, the, the soup. So it would burn. So that's... I, I learned how to I learned, I learned how to cook, and then there was a friend of mine who came over and uh, was sure that the, our food is not kosher for him. So I, I asked him, "Bring your your own dishes, and I'll cook for you." So it was I, I really learned to cook at a very early age. Kagai, so let, let's mention. And this is one of, of the, them. One of them. Yeah, a, a few of your odd jobs. You learned to sew when you were five. Um, you learned uh, to be a hunter. Uh, you hunted rabbits, if I remember correctly. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the, the number of odd jobs that you had because of need yeah. is incredible. And each of these odd odd jobs teaches you unexpected skills. Yeah. Um, so I think that having odd jobs, you know, when I, when I was growing up in Ottawa, um, not a not a poor family, but it was always encouraged to do things. So, so babysitting and uh, and cleaning the snow and sweeping the leaves and um, and working in construction. And I was a mailman for a summer. Um, you know, I I could write a book. I, I was even a guy hired by the synagogue to lead the junior congregation. 
Really? I was, yeah, I was in the choir. I, every, I, I sold pianos for a morning until I was fired. Um, each of these odd jobs that paid me 50 cents an hour turned out to be invaluable. So one of the things that we, I think we miss as parents, and maybe our students have it, is growing up and doing things. And it doesn't matter whether you're babysitting, um, odd jobs, summer jobs, pizza delivery. Um, yeah. I was I, I sold things from door to door. Hagai, you have no idea. You have no idea. I was a door to door salesman, even with French Canadians. And bonjour, Monsieur, je m'appelle Mirko Zemberg. Je suis votre représentant de cette fleur et des cadeaux gratuits pour vous donner. No, I, I sold all kinds of things from door to door, brushes mm -hmm. and cosmetics and cleaning fluids. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that uh, odd jobs when you're growing up are really, really important. What other ways can you acquire unexpected skills that are really pivotal for success? So I'm going to mention one. And in the meantime, you can think if there's others, which is, which is volunteering. So we talked about odd jobs that bring you 50 cents an hour, or in your case, rabbits to cook, chickens to lay eggs. Um, I know you grew chickens when you were a teenager. Most of us don't. Um, so volunteering, why, why, for me, this is the most important thing we've talked about so far. Why is volunteering so important? First of all, <laughs> you're in a good position. Nobody can fire you. <laughs> that's, that's one well, of the... Well, well, talk, talk, talk about your career huh? after, after you left LL, after your job ceased to exist and you retired. Yeah, okay. You had a you had you, you had a volunteering position inventing tools Before, for people with uh, with, with handicaps. Yeah, uh, that was interesting because actually I started it even while I was flying, not inventing tools, but I worked with uh, Yedidia, and um, he, uh, he I actually planned and designed help him built the museum that he built today for his uh, the, 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 to memorial to his son who was killed in the war. And uh, I helped him a lot and we became good friends. And that's how I got into this group of the uh, Kinanet. So, so it, anyway, but the point then, was- the why, point oh, No, was, no, uh, Hagai, time out. Yeah. The most, one of the one most wonderful things about volunteering is the network of people that you built. Yeah, true. So from Didi Vardi, whom you helped build a museum for, for creative children in memory of his, uh, his uh, son who was killed in the war. And from Didi Vardi, you met Yossi Vardi. And from Yossi Vardi, you met me. And, and you met other people. And this changed your life. You told me yeah. that, that um, this network that you are a wonderful representative of it changed your life. It made you viable, vibrant, uh, your contribution, the way that you feel when somebody dreams, a handicapped person dreams of being able to do something. And yeah. you make it possible for them to play basketball, to play games, to, 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 to type on a keyboard, whatever it is. That must be very satisfying. Yeah, true. But there, there was a, a, another element in this, which is uh, important to the skill that you mentioned before. You see, when you brought, I came with an idea and I started to talk about it. People say, look, it doesn't make sense. We don't understand. Can you make a drawing? So I made a drawing. I brought it to them in drawing. I showed him in a drawing. He said, well, we, we cannot see, we cannot see. It's, Three dimensional, and you gave me gave us on a, on a flat uh, board. Try to give us some more. So I made a prototype. So it's a small scale, actually a small scale of the of the toy, if you want. Or and and then I said, well, is, will it work with the uh, handicapped people? And he said, oh, 
okay? And then I had to build the real prototype from junk, just to show them that it works. And in many cases, they took it and never returned me to the, even the, the prototype so I can improve it. It was so good, they, 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 it, it really, I didn't work alone, let's put it this way. I, I consulted the um, uh, occupational therapist in order to know what, what's, what are the needs of the, those people. Because but, I, but I, 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 as a volunteer, in addition to the wonderful feeling of being able to help other people, um, you gained technological skills yeah, you gained thinking, thinking skills because, you know, as, as a pilot in LL, you weren't faced with these questions. Exactly. Um, and and I think I think that volunteering, certainly in, in, in my case, the stuff that I've done to help people has has helped me 10 times more. And And when you help other people, you get friends and you get new ideas. And you get this ping pong. I'm a, I'm a huge believer in um, in volunteering as a way of acquiring unexpected skills. Um, if you have any other other ways to acquire unexpected skills, um, let us know during the course of the uh, conversation today or during the course itself. Ah, that's a punch. Um, we go on to the second um, pillar of success as far as I'm concerned. Actually, maybe we'll talk about four today, we'll see. Um, <laughs> there's more than three. Um, the second one would be, for me, um, recruiting your demons, okay? Most people talk about how important it is to, um, you know, we all have demons. We have these terrible things that bother us about our lives, about our existence. Um, and very often they prevent us, so we feel they prevent us from living full lives. Um, and, and they say it's important to identify what your demons are. It's important to um, deal with them. And I'm saying, no, 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 no. What's really important is to challenge and recruit them, to get them to work for you to put your demons to work. A few words on demons, Hagai. Otherwise, I'm going to jumpstart you. Okay, jumpstart me. <laughs> the year that you spent self teaching when you were nine years old. Yeah. Was that a demon for you? Uh, yes, it is, in a way. Uh, yeah, at that, that time, at that time, it was uh, important to me just to, to hide. I, actually, it wasn't a, a kind of an escape. Um, yeah, well, to tell this, I, I can't. I, I don't have to repeat the story. I don't know. I was no, just, 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 just no, no, in, in one, in, in, one in, one way, in one sentence. In, in one, one second, sentence. I was afraid to go out of the house because of um, threat from a person and because I was sitting in the house and didn't want to tell my parents about it I read all the books that were in the house for a year I, I read the encyclopedia for so many times back and forth and and, and you know what it once helped me in the flight and and it, 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 this is a good story by the way you never heard it right I don't know this story Okay, this is, so, this, is, uh, this is the unexpected. Okay, Go okay. so I'll, I'll say in, 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 in one minute. Yeah. Uh, it was a flight from, uh, from uh, yeah, a flight from London to Amsterdam and the cargo flight. And we had, the cargo was three uh, vin, vin, um, vintage cars, which were on the way to Los Angeles for auction to be sold over there. And the, we can carry 150 tons and the three cars were only five tons. So the rate of climb was unbelievable, like a jet fighter. And the angle was very steep. And all of a sudden I started to feel smell of uh, a kind of perfume at the beginning. And then I realized, wow, this is the, um, the gasoline that used, we used to, to fly the, uh, the, 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 the piston engines in the 50s. And I, I, I secured my, my position. I told the pilots that I'm, I'm going down to check it. 
And when I opened the hatch to go to, to the main cargo, they, 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 the, the fumes got into me so hard that I almost vomited on the spot. So I, I closed it immediately and I said, okay, oxygen mask and, regu oxygen mask and regulators. And the captain decided, let, let me, let me uh, declare emergency. I said, stop, don't declare an emergency. We, in a, this rate of climb in a minute will be in a height that no light, nothing will, keep, will be ignited. Could, nothing could be ignited. Just depressurize the airplane. So we continued the climb, depressurization, and, and half an hour we, we cleared all the fumes. And, and then we landed. Well, okay, so, so, so Haggai. No, 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 let, let, let me tell the end of the story. I won't go. No, but I, I'm, just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just asking. So, so some jerks have yeah. sent you vintage cars with gasoline inside them? Yeah, this was a kind of a conspiracy between the. This gas was illegal in, in, in Los Angeles. It was contained lead and it was illegal over there. So, without the gasoline, that was, they couldn't sell the cars over there. So, the, without telling, my, although it was unnecessary to remove the gas, they didn't do it. But I, I'm not going into this, Dave. I'm, I'm going about the, the how, other thing. How, how did you know from the encyclopedias, though? Because I was, I learned that the people on, on the Kilimanjaro cannot light the, they couldn't light a match. Okay, that's it. How about connecting things, Kagai? That's brilliant. Yeah. Okay. But that's a great story, and okay, and, and, you live, and, and you live to tell it. Yeah, and you, let, let me tell you the end of it. The end of it that forty-five years later, I met the guy, the captain, and he said, "Do you remember this flight?" And he said, I said, yes, of course I remember the flight. He said, I still have nightmares because of this. So why? Because I was about to, de to declare emergency and descend. And every little spark could blow us up. And you, you stopped me from doing it. And, and they, I agreed. I almost disagree with you. But the first officer, because you had the coalition against me, and I took what you said, and, and, and that's what happened. So. I have to thank you for that, but I'm, I'm still having nightmares. 45 years later. So just imagine what could a, a small incident do to a person. I, I, I was not thinking about, I didn't have any, any trouble thinking about it in a clear mind. So no light, no, no, no ignition above 10,000 feet. That's incredible. So Hagai Cohen, you were, um afraid of being assaulted. You were yeah. afraid of telling your parents and you sat and self-educated. You did homeschooling <laughs> well, back I went in the to 1940s. I went to school at that time, but it, all my spare time at home, I, I read books. You did homeschooling at home and, and um, you, you recruited your, um, your demons. Um, and so I guess my, my story of the demons uh, would be uh, my agoraphobia that I was afraid of traveling and flying for many years. Um, and when I was able to control my monster, then I recruited it and I became an itinerant flyer. I had a gold card on British. Um, you remember me back in the day when I was uh, flying here and there. Um, always um, uh, with other kinds of... Um, a um, shall we say with alcohol, um, but still um, I get on the plane. And uh, this ability to recruit your demon is, I think, a um, an important factor. Whether your demon is your fear of speaking in front of crowds. So when I had agoraphobia, Hagai, I couldn't speak in front of two people. Now I don't have any trouble speaking on television. So our ability not only to acknowledge our demons and to live with them. No, 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 no. I'm going to get you guys working for me. I'm afraid to fly. I'm going to fly every month. I'm afraid to speak in public. I'm going to speak in public all over the world. I'm afraid of people making fun of my English, I'm going to become an Oxford accented English speaker. 
So that's my second pillar of success is recruiting your demons, identifying them, and then getting them to work for you. Okay? And uh, I would say that my third pillar of success is uh, what I call changing your fate. How does that sound to you, Chagai Cohen? It's an oxymoron, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, we, we know from experience that um, most people, successful people say, I was lucky. And uh, we, uh, you know that I never agree with it completely because uh, if you take a person and say, uh, I'm, I'm, I was lucky, how come you became so lucky? I asked my son, how come you, you were so lucky when you invented the, the voice over IP? You were not lucky, you were ready for it. You were doing many things. Two, two or three years you did other things which led you to this one. It's not luck. You actually wait for your luck or, or you wait for the opportunity to to do it to do something that you believe that you can do and uh, it's true and sometimes it's just luck because uh, sometimes some people you just uh, write the the you have the right number for the in the lottery so that's luck but that uh, that that Hagai, studies have shown that people who win the lottery yeah lose the, that's lose a the, different lose, story Lose, no, no, it's, 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 it's the same story. They they end up losing all their money. They end up miserable, sad. Yeah. Um, this is not the kind of success we want to talk about. We want to talk exactly. about the kind of success where at your age or at my age, we can look back and say, okay, we have a lot of luck in our lives. But when luck, when opportunity arose, we were there. And not only that, we chased after the luck. We chased it down. Yeah. If there was a if there was a meeting in New Jersey with my agoraphobia and my fear of flying, I would drink my bottle of gin and get on the plane. This is this is, I think, the um, the secret of success of many successful people. But what is changing your fate? How can you change your fate if if, if your fate is a how can you change it? You have to work hard if you know where to go. So, so, so what I'm going to... Uh, okay, what you're saying, actually, uh, have a focus in your life on a certain thing, and then you'll be able to get to the... Uh, to, once you learn all about it, maybe you'll have the chance to, to be, become whatever you want. The question is, what is success? This is the most important question. What is success? Is it money? Is it fame to be famous? Is it uh, to be uh, pretty for, for a model? I don't know. What is success? Well, success is different for different people. And that's why um, we are talking about it in this course, because everybody wants to be successful, but for every person... It's a different thing. It's a different thing. When I was a kid, there was a game called uh, Success. And in this game, Chagai, you um, had a card. And in your card, you wrote how much percent success was money, how much it was fame, and how much it was. So there was money, fame, and profession or something. There were three criteria. I don't remember. And you would write at the beginning of the game that you wanted 50% money, 20% uh, um, fame, and uh, 30 percent, uh, I don't know, something else, forget. And you would work during the game to achieve these uh, these uh, okay. benchmarks. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, success can be, um, doesn't have to be a, a professional success. It can be raising a wonderful family. It can be doing good for society. Uh, I can be being a good friend, being a good person. But at the end of the day, when you get older, you want to be able to look at yourself in the mirror and smile. So if you're asking me what success is, that, that's the success of 
looking at yourself in the mirror and smiling. And you know when I do that, Chagai? When? I, I do that only very rarely. Yeah. When I get on when I get on an airplane. Uh -huh. Okay. An hour after the plane takes off, I go to the bathroom and I look at myself in the mirror and smile. Okay. And say, you got on, you got, being in the cage. You you got on the plane. Um, if you ask me, what is my feeling of success? I, uh, because of that tr childish trauma, probably, and some issues with my father, I wanted all my life to be a good provider and, uh, and to take care of my children's studies and success in, in, in the academy. That was my goal. And um, I look at myself today and uh, I feel successful. Good friends with all my children, uh, good friends with all my grandchildren, and I hope to be with my grand great children as well when they will start talking. Yeah, okay. so Chagai, you have four wonderful children whom I know, and uh, a lot of uh, grandchildren whom I've taught at university. And um, you have a few great grandchildren that are at the beginning of their career. They're still tops. And, uh, and, and, and that's wonderful. Like, um, so I have two kids and, and being a daddy is, uh, it beats everything, right? Um, so yeah, everybody has to, has to define what success means, but it has to, it has to mean Haggai taking life by the horns and making goals for yourself and achieving them and, 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 and not necessarily low uh, bars of success but high bars of success, okay? And um, in class, I'll show the students, really, that there's, no, there's no limit to how high you can aim for your success. And maybe the people that we think of as yeah, highly successful have a very high, high, high standard, a high bar. And what we teach in the course is something to, very simple, that each person has to define, which is to be the best you that you can possibly be. So everybody's going to take that definition of what is the best you. But if you run with it, if you don't give up, if you don't give in, if you don't get distracted, dismayed, disappointed, dissed, there is one step before that. Mm. It's you have to like yourself. If you don't like yourself, you wouldn't be able even to identify your demons. Yes, because if you can't like yourself, you really can't like other people either, right? Exactly. So, uh, but but I, I can't teach people to like themselves. They, they have to find <laughs> ways to like themselves. It took me many years. Um, to start liking myself, and um, it's it's something that you have to do. I'm not qualified to teach other people how to do that. Um, but let's go back to changing fate. So when I look at my life, um, there were several times when I completely changed my environment. Okay, I moved from Canada to Israel when I was not even 18 years old. Spent the last 53 years in Israel, 54 except for one year in Canada. So whatever fate would have awaited for me in Toronto was not the same fate that awaited for me here. I would have had a different family, a different profession, different friends, a whole different life. I have two siblings who stayed in Canada. They had different lives than I had. So I'm, I'm a big proponent of, of changing something big in your life. You know, this is my fate. To stay in Ottawa, I'm going to change it. I'm going to move away. My fate to study in Jerusalem, no. I'm going to move to Tel Aviv University and begin again. So at least I can look back at my life and see there were times when I changed things big time. 
And I just got up and walked away. Could be from a profession, relationship, whatever. Not all of them, but if you can look at yourself and say, okay, it's time to go somewhere for a year or two. It's time to have a completely different trajectory in my life than I thought I would have. So this is my third pillar of success. And while we were talking, I want to add another one that connects us, and that is storytelling. Okay. Um, be, being able to be a good storyteller. Uh, this is a this is a very very good skill, and, and uh, I, actually, we had to mention it even before that this is one of the skills that the person needs in order to success, to be successful. Because without the storytelling ability, you wouldn't be able to convince, if you're a scientist, you wouldn't be able to convince the investors. Without the storytelling, you wouldn't be able to sell yourself or present yourself or do whatever you want. And storytelling is very, very important. How much storytelling do the students learn at Shankar? Nothing, I think. It's only in our course. Only in our course. Yeah. So let's let's talk about storytelling for, for a moment. Um, together with music, we are storytellers before anything else, really. Um, and uh, Yuval Noah Harari speaks about this in his first book, that the human beings were able to come together because of stories that they believed in jointly. Um, and like you say, my ability to um, to reach out to people is based on my ability to tell them stories. My success as a scientist. You're, you're, you're completely right. There's one thing that's more important than telling a story, by the way. That um, both of out. us... <laughs> no, there's more important thing in telling a story, uh, Haggai, yes. um, which is actually listening to somebody else's story. Yeah, okay. That's true. But um, also and we're, to tell a story to tell a real to tell a story. You have to. Uh, the, you need a certain ability, by the way. I think well, it's well, acquired, well, well, acquired, acquired ability. It's to look around and turn every situation into a story. And um, look, if if you take a, a ordinary journalist. What he, if he wants to sell his story to a newspaper, it must have a drama in it and a conflict. Without the two things, there would be no story. So uh, how do you make a conflict? You can make a conflict to say that this old man survived. Uh, he, he was two, two, 20 seconds late to cross the street in which a truck lost his bra brakes over them. It, it, this is a kind of uh, making a, a a, a drama out of a small story. The person waited until the truck will pass. Okay. Kagai, Kagai, we, we have to be storytellers, not only for our careers. When we go out on a date. Yeah. We're storytellers. Um, or story listeners. Um, and the most important thing in a story, in addition to the plot, is empathy. Right? We yeah. In order to, to tell a story that will... To be with other people, yeah. you want people to feel something. So, yeah. uh, Haggai, in the first homework the students have is to write a book on our books, talking a little bit about themselves. Uh, this is a written story. And um, if you're writing a story about yourself, um, how are you going to get other people interested in it? This is a well, I, okay, so I'll, I'll give you a few tips. I'll give you a few tips. Okay. So what makes people empathetic is uh, if you are somebody who's been unjustly treated, if you write about that. Underdog. It, 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 underdog. Circumstances have conspired against you. Everything was fine and then something terrible happened and there's bad guys. Um, if, you're, if you're particularly talented in something, and you talk about that. That's a great way to get empathy. Um, if you are somebody who's fighting for something just, 
you know, fighting for for legislation, fighting to protect people. This is a way to get empathy. And um, we'll we'll discuss with the students more ways to to be empathetic. Um, but it's not only in a written story, it's a presentation, it's a job interview, it's a lecture. Our ability to tell stories is based on our primitive humanness. And, um, and, and the moment we make it personal, that's when we can beat the computers, you see. Yeah, you use com computer, com computers uh, don't have uh, difficult fathers. Computers weren't growing, didn't grow up in, in, in war or other circumstances. Um, computers did not fight for justice. Um, and uh, computers did not make personal change. Um, and uh, these are things that set us aside from AI when, when, when we make it, in a sense, personal. And when we do that, we also make it universal. So I, I don't want to get too much into storytelling, except that um, I guess for me, it's always been a, a pillar uh, of my career. Uh, certainly um, as a scientist, being able to talk about what you do. My professor told me that in order to be a good scientist, you have to keep it simple. You have to be able to tell your mother-in-law what you're doing in the laboratory. You, you forgot one important thing. What is that? It's elevator pitch. Yeah. This sure. is very important to storytelling and, and, and the special skill. So absolutely. So yeah. we will talk more about storytelling uh, when we meet you guys, because um, it's something that we have to practice together. It's uh, something we have to experience. Um, Chagai, is there anything that I've forgotten? Any other pillars? Uh, that you want to mention. There's certainly many, many other a, um, ingredients to success that we haven't touched on today, but we have the rest of the course. Uh, uh, well, if you want the, um, the, the, what month you were born is important. Okay, but that's not something you have control of. Yeah, I know, but if you have the, if, but it's an, it's, it's an element, it's an element which improves your chances, let's put it this way. But th that's, that's exactly, I mean, what month you're born is, 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 part of your, born. is part of your fate. Yeah. So if, for example, you were born in November and you go to school in a class with kids who were born in January, then that puts you at a disadvantage. Exactly. If you're on a hockey team and everybody was born in January and you were born in November, you're at a disadvantage. Yeah, and if you are becoming but, a, a... But, but, but Haggai, that's a statistical disadvantage. I know. Also, they, uh, in America, they have um, um, income per inch. You know that? Sure. Of your height. Yeah. But when, when I was a kid, there were still famous basketball players who were five foot eight. Yeah. They, they they but they recruited their demons. So absolutely. So Chagai, we're going to sum up. Today we've been talking about the pillars of success. Again, personal. Everybody's different. Everybody has a different childhood. Everybody has different genetics. We see differently, hear differently, smell differently, taste differently, feel differently. We're in different parts of our journey and yet hopefully some of the stuff that we've talked about whether it's creativity last uh, last lesson uh today we talked about acquiring unexpected skills the one nobody not, nobody thinks that are going to contribute to your success and those are the cornerstones to your success we talked about recruiting your demons making them work for you and changing your fate and a little bit about storytelling, which we'll concentrate on when we get together. So uh, in the meantime, the, uh, the homework for the students is uh, we've talked about um, the importance of asking questions. 
Okay. So uh, the homework for the second lesson is to take anything. It doesn't have to be a fruit. Okay. And to ask it questions. To write an ebook about the unexpected. in a kiwi okay so what questions are you going to ask a kiwi okay that's going to give you things that surprise you 10 surprising facts about a kiwi and i don't care if you ask chat gpt because it's all about the question isn't it okay so does it have to be a kiwi no surprise us so i want an ebook from all the students this is due on april 15th about the 10 questions you would ask something, somebody, and, su and surprise us. So Chagai Cohen, um, volunteer teacher in the course and my wonderful buddy of 20 years, ever since we sat down together in Aroma because it was raining. Um, I'm going to say goodbye, Shabbat Shalom, and to all our students. And we cannot wait to meet you in person on April 15th. Bye-bye. Toda Chagai Cohen. Ah, Nifla. Toda Chagai Cohen.